So we're, what I'm trying to do is to tell you why Everett's simple interpretation is not obviously true. It is true, but not obviously true. Uh, because we never feel like we ourselves are in a superposition. So Niels Bohr and his friends who helped invent the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics insisted that they never felt quantum mechanical. They never went through life as if they were in a superposition of different states. So they said you must treat the observer as classical. So their explanation of the Schrodinger cat thought experiment has a classical observer, here played by Niels Bohr, quantum mechanical cat, and the story is the observer opens the box, observes the cat, the wave function collapses, and now either the cat's awake and the observer saw it awake, or the cat's asleep and the observer saw it asleep. That's the classical, sorry, that's the Copenhagen story. Everett says, you're not that special. You're made of atoms. Atoms obey the rules of quantum mechanics. Therefore, you obey the rules of quantum mechanics. Therefore, I should put parentheses around you and treat you, the observer, as if you have a wave function. What, what is going to happen to you? Solve the Schrodinger equation. That's all you have to do. And happily, in this case, it's actually pretty easy to do that. The measurement is just a particular physical interaction. There's nothing weird or special about measurements. But what happens, and this is unambiguously true as a prediction of the Schrodinger equation, is that the combined system, remember there's only one wave function for the whole universe, so the combined cat plus observer system evolves into an entangled superposition, part of which says the cat's awake and the observer saw it awake, part of it says the cat's asleep and the observer saw it asleep, but they're both there. The puzzle is, Niels Bohr would come along and say, this says I'm in a superposition of seeing the cat awake and seeing the cat asleep, and that has never happened to me. This is empirically wrong. When I measure things, I always feel like I've perceived a definite measurement outcome. How is this compatible with what's going on here? And Everett's answer is, you have misidentified yourself in the wave function. And to make this clear, let's be even a little bit more honest, because remember I said there's only one wave function for the entire universe, but then I showed you a wave function that has a cat and an observer. What happens to the rest of the universe? What about that? We should include that too. And so we can. We put it in, we call it the environment. It is represented by a picture of leaves of grass. But this literally means everything else in the whole universe, okay? So in this room, when I, if I were to do an experiment on the table, the environment would be all the air molecules in the room, all the photons of light in the room, all the things you don't explicitly keep track of. Classically, you wouldn't have to keep track of them. They would just bounce off harmlessly, not make a big difference. But quantum mechanically is a different story. And this is the more modern way of thinking about these things by a, an idea called decoherence. Because think about that cat in the box in a superposition of awake and asleep. There's air in the box. There's light in the box. These parts of the environment are going to interact with the cat long before we open the box. So the environment becomes entangled with the cat. The light particles and the, and the atoms in the box will interact with the cat differently depending on whether the cat is awake or asleep because it's literally in a different position in the box. And so that entanglement is really when the wave function evolves into two, at a superposition of two different things, and then the measurement just goes along for the ride. You open the box and you become entangled with the cat as well. So what we're left with is this final state of the universe. There's one term that says cat's awake, environment saw the cat awake, observer saw the cat awake, plus a whole other way of thinking about reality. Cat's asleep, observer, uh, environment saw the cat asleep, observer saw the cat asleep. And because of this decoherence effect where the environment is different in these two things, these two parts of the wave function will never influence each other ever again. Remember in the double slit experiment, the electron could go through either slit and then interfere with itself 
but it interferes with itself because it's exactly the same electron doing exactly the same thing. This part of the wave function can never interfere with this part because these environments have gone their separate ways. They're completely perpendicular to each other in the literal mathematical sense. So it as, is as if they have become completely separate worlds. Nothing that happens in this part of the wave function can be affected by or affect that part. They're independent of each other now. So Everett's insight is to say, you don't think you're ever in a superposition because you are not the combination of this observer who saw the cat awake and this observer who saw the cat asleep. You are one or the other. But there is also the other one. So if you saw the cat awake, quantum mechanics predicts there's another one of you that saw the cat asleep. When I say quantum mechanics, I mean everyone agrees this is straightforwardly what you would get if you just let the Schrodinger equation do its work. The disagreement is about whether or not you should let that happen. So this is the Everettian or many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics because he says if you believe in superpositions of electrons, you should be able to believe in superpositions of worlds and the Schrodinger equation makes those worlds become real whether you like it or not. There was no need for measurements or observations. There was just decoherence according to the usual Schrodinger equation. So not everyone agrees yet. So there are some objections. And there are objections to the many worlds version of, of quantum mechanics. Uh, I would say that you know, within the physics community, there's a healthy fraction of people who do accept many worlds. But there's also those who don't. There's not any agreement here. There are reasons to object to many worlds that are bad reasons, and there are also legitimate worries. So I don't mind if you object to the theory, but I want you to object to it for the right, sensible reasons. So let's get rid of some of the bad reasons. One bad reason is just you kind of are annoyed by all these universes. It's just too many. I don't like it. Like three or four I could understand, but you're talking about an infinite number of universes, or at least a very, very large number. If that's your objection, then your objection is not to many worlds. Your objection is to quantum mechanics. And that's hard to object to because it fits the data really well. Once you have quantum mechanics, once you have wave functions that are superpositions of all these different possibilities, the worlds are there as possibilities in the set of all possible wave functions. Every version of quantum mechanics includes wave functions that describe many worlds. The only question is whether you take them seriously or just hold your breath and refuse to believe that they're actually there. So if you accept the reality of wave functions at all, you can't object that there are just too many worlds you don't like it. Another bad objection is that this can't be tested. Well, it depends on, not to parse things too carefully, it depends what you mean by the word this. <laughs> The Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics is 100% testable. Remember, the Everett interpretation is not a postulate that there are multiple worlds. It's a postulate that the Schrodinger equation is always right. That's a very testable thing. Just look at systems. Don't measure them. Don't disturb them. See if they always obey the Schrodinger equation. There are alternative theories in which they don't in which wave functions suddenly collapse all by themselves. And there are experiments looking for exactly those things. And if they ever find it, many worlds will be falsified, just like that. It's a perfectly testable scientific theory. Another easily answered objection is where does the energy come from to make all of these worlds? I mean, the world, by which we mean the universe, certainly seems like it contains a lot of energy. You make multiple copies of it. Where do you get all the energy? There's an energy crisis already. This makes it worse. But it doesn't really. And this is, a, this is a difficult objection to talk about because at the level of the equations, there's no worry whatsoever. The equations are perfectly clear about what happens. There's energy in the wave function of the whole universe, the wave function of the universe, that includes all of the branches all at once. And that energy is conserved. But the branches which represent the individual copies of classical reality that we find ourselves on, contribute less and less 
to the energy of the whole shebang. So there's a weight that you can attach to any one branch of the wave function of the universe. And as time goes on and it splits apart into more and more branches, the branches get thinner. Now you might say, I look at the energy in the Earth or the sun or the moon or the stars. It doesn't seem like they're getting thinner. That's because you're getting thinner too. Relative to each other, everything in the universe looks like it always has the same energy, but the contribution of that branch to the overall energy becomes less and less as time goes on. So energy is 100% completely conserved. There's no problem with that. The final slightly askew objection is, what about my personal identity? This is a vague objection because it's more like psychological than uh, physical or philosophical, but you like to think of yourself as having a history, as being born, growing up, having a story to tell, you know, et cetera. And many worlds says now suddenly there's many copies of you. Should you feel kinship toward those other copies? Should you try to arrange the world so that other versions of you in the multiverse are happy or something like that? And the answer is, you just got to think this through. There's something new going on in many worlds, no doubt. The, the thing that is new is that the history of a person is more like a branching tree than a single line. But once those branches happen, they are now separate people. Identical twins start as the same single cell, but they split apart and become different people. No one tries to say, like, oh, it's okay if one twin dies because we have the spare over here. They're two separate people. Likewise, for the copies of you in many worlds, they're all separate people. It's not like, I don't mind if all the other copies of me die because I'm still here or vice versa. Every one of them has some personal dignity. You just have to sort of update your idea of what an individual person is. But you can change, you can do that. It's actually not that hard. It's very different than what we're grown up intuitively to think about. But it makes perfect sense. It hangs together quite nicely. There are no ethical, moral, political implications of the idea of all of these different worlds. Nevertheless, there are perfectly legit physics problems here. And so now I want to shift gears uh, as, we, as we close the talk a little bit. Because many physicists will say, you know, who cares? Like, sure, you get a well-defined theory, et cetera, et cetera. But I care about making predictions and things like that. I'm not going to be bothered about whether it's many worlds or not. But I think that's wrong. Because there are puzzles that we have in physics that we haven't yet answered. And maybe part of that is because we don't understand quantum mechanics. I don't think it's a leap of speculation to say that if we understood quantum mechanics better, maybe that would help us understand some of the other puzzles that we have. So one way of thinking about it is as an additional set of questions that arise when you think about things from the many worlds perspective. In other theories, you would start with a classical theory, the ball rolling on a hill or an electron in a hydrogen atom. And then we teach our students a set of rules to quantize these classical theories. But nature doesn't do that. Nature just is quantum mechanical from the start. You get a classical limit, et cetera. But really, if you think about it, the way to construct the correct theory of the world should be to think about wave functions and Hamiltonians and the Schrodinger equation from the start, not to start with some classical theory and quantize it. But that turns out to be kind of hard and challenging. Not impossible, but something that we haven't really put our attention to yet, and that's important. 